Thank you. All right. All right, everybody. As you can see, I don't have my normal tripod. I don't know what somebody did with it. Well, now I see it. I'm a little hot here. Check, check. Check, check. That's bad. Let's see here. I should. Oh man, this is some terrible stuff right here. I'm not even going to tell you where I think that came from. Just let me hold it for you. I'll hold it back here for you. Sorry for the technical difficulties, everybody. You guys can turn your Bibles to 1 Samuel 17. Well, it would seem that somebody took my tripod. I'm telling you. They may have. Chapter 17. And for those of you who are tuning in live, I apologize for all that moving around. Somebody stole my tripod, and the one that I have I'm using now probably not going to work for very much longer. So, uh, but we're going to proceed anyway. We're going to press forward. Everybody doing okay? Everybody survived the, the inclement weather yesterday? It was pretty ominous over Durham. Uh, we didn't get it too bad uh, in Creedmoor, um, but, uh, but here we are. All right, I'm going to open us in a word of prayer, and then we'll look at uh, the First Samuel chapter 17, the latter part of it. Father, we thank you for another day of your grace. Uh, thank you for the rain that we got. Uh, for some of us, it might have been uh, a bit much at all at one time. Um, but I pray that you would uh, have just seen us through. And for those who suffer damage to their homes and uh, things like that, Lord, uh, I pray that in the coming uh, days or weeks that they'd be able to get those things repaired and get back to life as normal. Um, uh, whatever inconvenience is, Lord, we just, uh, uh, just, just lay it on you and ask that you'd help us make, to make it through. Uh, Lord, certainly there are much greater needs and concerns uh, in this world, uh, as we've seen yesterday in the news and throughout the news today down in Texas, and our hearts are just overwhelmed uh, with uh, just, Lord, how far uh, mankind as a whole uh, seems to be slipping into the abyss uh, and how far they seem to be uh, from you. And, um, and, and, I, and I, beyond a shadow of a doubt, know that that's the root of all this. And so... Uh, Help us, Lord, in things like this to, to take things matters seriously with regard to our, our testimony and the gospel that we so desperately need to get out into this world, uh, not just in word, but in deed, uh, in the manner in which we live. And um, Lord, I pray that even tonight in this lesson from the Old Testament that we might see that gospel and learn how best to live it. And um, uh, just, uh, just commend this time to you. Thank you for those who are here. Uh, Lord, we pray for those who cannot be here for whatever reason, that you just work in their midst. And um, we pray for those who are sick, maybe in the hospital or the care facility or rehabilitation, and that you would just be with them. And we just commit this night to you and ask for your will and your way to occur. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Somebody's going off. Somebody's beating. 
Is, it, is there somebody here? the person that took that tripod. It could be. The alarm is Somebody's going hearing aid. Is the battery going dead in it? So it's kind of a catch-22, you know, when your hearing aid battery goes dead and it starts to beep and you can't hear it because your hearing aid battery is going dead. So life is difficult. All right, so we have been in 1 Samuel chapter 17 for a couple weeks now. Uh, a very, very familiar story of David and Goliath. And I'm going to back up to verse 31 so that we kind of see where we are. And I'm going to, I'm going to continue uh, just working through this bit by bit and making some observations and, and asking you some questions. So in verse 31 and 32, this is what uh, Samuel tells us. Now when the words which David spoke, remember he had just come to the battlefield with cheese and crackers, uh, and he was asking everybody what was going on, and they're telling him about this giant, what will happen if somebody slays him. And uh, So when the words which David spoke were heard, and they reported them to Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him, this giant. Your servant will go and fight with the Philistine. Now, what I want to ask you is this. For a moment, I just want you to... We're going to hear Saul's reaction to this uh, proposition that, that David is making, or this volunteering that, that David is making. But I want to hear your reaction... And, and in doing that, I want you to just imagine that you're uh, another soldier on the battlefield that day, and you don't know David from Adam. You don't know the end of the story like we've heard it for so many years from when we were wee little children. And I just want you to, to contemplate what would your response be? What would the thoughts be that go through your mind when this little shepherd boy comes up and volunteers to go do what? no other soldier in all of Israel is willing to do. What would be your thoughts? Well, that's it. We're done. Yeah. This is going to be quick. <laughs> this is going to be quick. And, and if, it's going to be quick. And if, and I don't think this is the case, but if you remember back at the very beginning, the proposition that Goliath made was, look, whatever the results of this are, if, if Goliath wins, then you're our slaves. And if your guy wins, then we're your slaves. I don't know that that was a binding agreement. That doesn't seem to be what happens after this unfolds. But if that was in the back of their mind, they might be thinking, oh, no. You know, we're putting our own, you know, necks in, in, in the hands of this kid. But maybe that wasn't the actual, maybe that wasn't a binding agreement. Maybe that was just the words of Goliath and, and they didn't mean much. Anybody got anything else? Here you have seasoned fighters. And they're not going to go up against Goliath. You got this teenage boy. Yeah. Never been in a battle with a separate animal. Yeah. Who did they think he is? Yeah. And we don't even know about that. This kid literally just brought bread and cheese to the battlefield. We know that he's armed with a staff, probably his shepherd's staff. There's no reason, as we read later in the story, to think that he has any sort of armor on. So he probably has a shepherd's garment on, a robe of some sort, and, and sandals. And as we read further on, we're going to see that most likely these other guys, they might not have had quite the armor that Saul had, but they certainly had mail and helmets and swords. And, and David's got none of this. And he's a wee little lad compared to everybody else out there. And... He is speaking with such confidence. And, and it, it must have just blown the mind. Um, and, and I experience that daily with Samuel James Phelps, who just you know, has the world you know, right there in the palm of his hand and knows how everything works and everything is simple you know, that he's never done in his life. And, and, and I would bet there were probably some people like his own brothers who thought, that's exactly what David's doing. Of course, he, he knows how to do everything that he's never done before in his life, you know? And so there were a thousand reasons to be concerned about this. But let's go on and see the one that really matters. And that's the commander-in-chief of this army, and that's King Saul. And so let's see what he says about this. But before we do, I have another question written down here. What was the, what was the reaction of the idea of Jesus being the Messiah? 
Right? Yeah. What were some of the what were some of the comments that came about as people were introduced to Jesus? Is this idea starting to unfold that he might be the Christ, the Messiah? What were some of the criticisms that came out? Okay, so isn't he the, the son of that carpenter? And where was he from? Nothing good comes from Nazareth. No, nothing good comes from Nazareth. Because then, and that remember, he was from multiple places. Okay, he was born in one place, but he grew up in Nazareth. And can anything come from there? You know. And so there was all kinds of reasons to look at Jesus as just some uneducated Jewish boy from humble background. I mean, really, on the surface, the only thing he had going for him was that he was from the tribe of Judah. But yet, he was from those humble back, that humble background, that hum humble lineage that, that God would raise up the Messiah. And obviously, from the past two weeks, you can see that I'm absolutely fixated on the idea that, that the story of David and Goliath is a picture of our salvation. Now, I believe it literally happened. But I also believe that it was also a picture of things to come. And there's many parallels between that and the salvation that we would experience in Christ. Let's look at verse 33 and see Saul's reaction to David's proposition or him volunteering. And Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. For you are a youth and he is a man of war from his youth. So what's Saul's take on this? Lost yeah, they can't Yeah. I mean, from what the eyes see, this guy, muscle to muscle, man to man, experience to experience, age to age, weaponry to no weaponry, from every single angle you could possibly look at this, David, you're not thinking clearly. This isn't the job for you. Now, you might expect that David would kind of tuck his tail underneath his legs uh, and, and, and head home disappointed. But this non-warrior looking shepherd boy who just delivered cheese and crackers to the battlefield is getting ready to argue his case with the king of Israel. Now wrap your head around that. And then think about the idea. Now, the scripture also tells us that the Spirit of God is upon David. And what does the Scripture tell us in the New Testament about the Spirit of God on us? Paul tells us that we've not been given a spirit of what? Of fear and timidity. Okay? So here the Spirit is upon him, and this little boy, I mean, he's not seven or eight, I'm sure he's a teenager, but this young man is getting ready to begin to have a verbal confrontation with the king of Israel. And then when you throw even more into the background the fact that David knows he's been anointed the future king of Israel, I don't even know how to add that into the dynamic. Right now the biggest issue is this, this giant over here. And he's getting ready to argue his case. And listen to what he says. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and I struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. See, he has defied the armies of the, because he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. So what's David's perspective on this? Why he should be allowed to do this? The God's on my side. Yeah. And what has God shown so far in his life, in his life experience? He's faithful. He's faithful? Yeah, he's he can do big things. Okay. <laughs> Think of it this way. Size doesn't matter. Because that's what every, all, the, all the other soldiers were looking at. Some size and experience. And David said, look, um, I've been up against some opponents that are much more agile than I am. You know, lions and bears and much stronger than I am. But the proof is in the pudding. And apparently my size is not a, not a big issue 
when God is on my side and he is in my favor because he has delivered me from both of these things on multiple occasions. Okay? And so that's what he says. So who is, who is David trusting in? Trusting in God. Okay? He points that out. He says there that your servant who's killed, uh, where is it? The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion. Now, why didn't he just say that at the very beginning? Why did David go and mention all of his conquests against the lions and bears and the things that he did with the lions and bears? Why is that important if at the end of the day, God gets all the credit and, and he's the one who delivered me? Because God kept him safe, but David still killed the lions and the bears. Okay, all right. He's got to, he's got to convince Saul he's able to do what he says he can do. Okay, all right. I'm in a plane that's crashing and I don't know how to fly a plane just because I trust God will help me right. doesn't mean he's going to teach me how to fly the plane in that moment. Right. Well, I read a story. I'll still get on the radio and ask them to help me. Exactly. I read a story last week where, no, no kidding, I think it was down in Florida, a guy is on a small uh, dual prop Cessna. This is totally for chasing a rabbit, but it was a great story and I'm sure I'll find a, a way to, to put it in a sermon one day. And he, he realized that the pilot is incapacitated. The pilot has passed out. And this guy, and they're, they're descending at 500 feet a minute or something like that. So the guy gets up next to the, the, the pilot, and he puts on the pilot's headphones, and he starts talking to radio control, and they put somebody on that knows that doesn't know that airplane, but he pulls up on Google a picture of the cockpit, and the guy lands the plane <laughs> with no problems whatsoever. And ground control, they had it on, on the news, couldn't believe that, Somebody who'd never flown a plane before just landed that plane. So anyway, I chased that rabbit. I'm sorry. So where were we? So so why why is it? What I want us to see here is this balance, and, and I want to be careful here, because there's a there's a paradox, if you will. There's tension between a lot of the major doctrines of the Bible, and the tension here is is that God is the one who delivered it, but David had to do something. David didn't say, and so I would just sit back on my little chair on my stool, and um, when the lions and the bears would come, I would just believe that God would deliver me. And the lions, like the lions in the, in the lion's den with Daniel, the Lord would just shut their mouths, and they would run away in the middle of the night, and I did nothing. The Lord and the Lord alone, did he say that? No, he didn't. He didn't. And so there's this, there's this tension between the idea that on the one hand, David did something. David had some level of skill that he attributes to the Lord. Apparently it's a, either a strong hand or a, 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 a sling and a stone or whatever it might be. But at the end of the day, he attributes that to the Lord. And so we see that tension between us trusting in the Lord and us recognizing that God is the one doing these great things in our lives. But yet, what is our responsibility? We're to act how? In faith. Faithfully. And so what I see in, in David is that David is acting faithfully. Faithfully with his, his heart directed towards God and God's end, and whether it's protecting his sheep or delivering the nation, delivering the nation of Israel from this, this giant or whatever it might be. He's acting faithfully, and we're going to see what acting faithfully looks more like even as we continue <coughs> on. Okay? So that's where I'm at. Anybody got anything else? David put a lot of time into using that sling. Right. I mean, you can spin that sling and you don't know where it's going to go. Mm -hmm. <coughs> sling and hit something between the eyes. Yeah. That takes skill, too. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <coughs> absolutely. And again, there's the, it wasn't like he just, you know, picked this, these things up and, and thought, you know, I understand these are weapons and I'm just going to believe that you know, all I got to do is swing it and, and, and it'll be guided. No, there was a level of skill on his part. But yet he still recognizes that at the end of the day, no one's going to look at this little kid with a stone and a sling and think that there's the obvious winner. And we'll talk about that matchup in a minute and, and why it might be that. So uh, let's go on to the, to the next verse. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Boy, he was an easy one. He just shifted him right over. You know? Oh, well, you know, bears and lions. Maybe Saul was really scared of bears and lions. I don't know. Maybe that was just what pushed him absolutely over the edge. So he says, go and the Lord be with you. But he's not done yet. In verse 38, it says, so Saul clothed David 
with his armor, and he put a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. So this might be chain mail or some other sort of mail, but it's armor. And David fastened his sword to his armor, and he tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I can't walk with these, for I've not tested them. So David took them off. So first question is, how did Saul respond to David throwing a counter-argument as to why he should be able to do this? He at least have to look like a warrior. Okay. All right. He conceded and agreed to allow him to do it. But he said, go and, how do he say it? May, may the Lord be with you. Or, yeah, it's go and the Lord be with you. But what does the offer of Saul's armor to David suggest to us? He's going to need help. Yeah. Okay, you go. I'm glad, and that's a mighty powerful story with the lions and the bears. But um, he didn't have enough faith that David and whatever David came with was going to be enough. And so he decided to add a little bit more oomph to it and put this, this stuff on him. And, and, and what was David's reason for not wearing the armor? <coughs> used to it. It, it felt funny. Okay, it felt funny. He wasn't used to it. It was heavy. He couldn't walk. What else? Probably couldn't see with that helmet on. Probably couldn't see with the helmet on. Other thing, David might have already had it in his mind, a plan. And see, David wasn't going to fight fire with fire, was he? He was going to, he was going to do a completely different military tactic here, and he was going to take Goliath by surprise. And even that, don't, 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 don't fall to the side where we think that it's the wit of David that won the battle. David had some wit about him. But where did he get that idea? I think David would attribute it to the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord inside of him, giving him this ability and this mind to do this. But what I want you to see here is that David had to use what he was gifted with, not what Saul was gifted with. It, just, it wasn't just that we needed to have an unarmored man, an unarmed man go up there so that this was an obvious victory by, on, the, on the Lord's side and by the Lord's own power. It wasn't just that. It's the fact that David was trained and gifted and talented in, in certain ways, and God was the one who had ordained all that. God had given him the, him the experience in the fields with the sheep and the lions and the bears and all these things, the skill with the, sto with the stone and the sling. And for David to go and use something else, it'd be like me trying to win your hearts and preach the gospel by singing. Because I can't sing. I mean, that's just not the way the Lord has gifted me. And so we've got to remember that. And to me, this is one of the main teaching points of this passage when we look at this, is that we've got to recognize the way that God has gifted us. And not be so keen on, oh, wow, look at that big, mighty warrior. You see, a person not motivated by the Spirit of God would have walked into that camp and said, well, you give me that big spear, and you give me that big helmet, and you put that chain mail on me, and I'll go kick that giant's butt. But no, that's not the way it worked. This young man, motivated by the Spirit of the Lord, knew what the Lord had gifted him to do. And he knew that that would be the means by which God would do it. And so all of us are a little different. And we've got to be really careful when we're comparing um, ourselves with other people. You know, I, I can't look, look down on somebody or think that they're lesser than me because they might not be quite as gifted of a teacher if I have that gifting or whatever it might be uh, or, or anything like that. So we've got to be real, real careful that we don't have to assume that everybody's got to do their thing the way we do it and with our giftings. Like our giftings are higher than somebody else or our ways are more important than somebody else. Because God's gifted us all in different ways, and he wants them all to work together for his glory and ultimately for the good of his body. Okay? So don't get hung up on what you don't have. Concentrate on what the Lord has given you and blessed you with, and refine those things faithfully and use them for him. Okay? Look at verse number 40. Then he took his staff in his hand. This is David. Hold on. This is a long paragraph. And he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook. And he put them in a shepherd's bag. So he, he's dressed 
like a shepherd, down to the purse, in a pouch which he had, and his sling was in his hand. And he drew near to the Philistine. So I'm imagining, based upon the, pre the previous chapter or the first part of this chapter, you've got these two peaks on each side. You've got the valley down below. And, 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 and somehow Goliath knows that, that somebody's approaching. I'm assuming David's got a little backup behind him. And Goliath's probably got some backup behind him. And they're approaching the, the valley. And so the Philistine came, and he began drawing near to David. And the man who bore the shield went before him. Now, who's bearing a shield for who here? It's the armor bearer for Goliath. For Goliath. No indication that, that David has anybody bearing a shield for him. There's no indication that David even has a shield. He's got a sword strapped somewhere to his body. But apart from that, he's got a shepherd's staff, a, a pouch, a sling, and some stones in the bag. I think he even has a sword. He does. He, steals, he takes life. Does he? Yeah. You might be right. I think you are. Okay. So he doesn't even have a sword. Now I got thrown off. It's all right. It's all right. You know what I do when I get thrown off? I go back and read it again. So he had the pouts, which he had, and a sling in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. So the Philistine came, and he began drawing near to David, and the man who bore the shield went before him. Now I want you to think about this. Goliath is nine and a half feet tall. Imagine what the shield bearer must look like. I mean, if he's the average height or even taller than the average height, he's probably six foot tall. <coughs> What's the one thing that he's not going to be able to protect? His head. His head. Goliath's head. Mm -hmm. I mean, can you see? Can you see that? Even if the guy was six foot tall, he'd be up here like this, jumping up in the air, trying to block the stone. And so in the midst of all this, it's not that we just have blind faith and just, okay, let's just go willy-nilly and stop thinking or anything like that. But in the midst of all this, David has to realize, I got one spot, and I can hit it, and that's what I'm going to do. And so he goes out there without a sword, without a shield, and I doubt that the armor bearer even had the shield up to begin with. Why would he? He didn't need it. Goliath is getting ready to say, what am I, a dog? You're coming with a stick? <clears throat> and so David, now whether this is the spirit of the Lord or, or the wit of David or whatever it might be, David is masterfully setting all this up to turn the tables on Goliath and kind of do a surprise attack, you know? And so, and when the Philistine looked about and he saw David, he disdained him. For he was only a youth, he was ruddy, and he was good looking. So the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beast of the field. Now, maybe I already asked this, but I've got it written here again, so it won't, be, it won't hurt to repeat it. How did David prepare for the battle? Five stones. Five stones? Smooth. Smooth stones? And the reason for it. Okay. Do we know what it is? It comes out of the sling easier. Okay. All right. Precise. Okay. And then he acted. He acted. All right. He acted quickly. What else did What else did he do? When he trusted in God. He trusted in God. All right. He did everything just as if he would have done it if he were hiding a lion in the bear, because that's what he knew how to do. And just like Miss Weezy says, if God brings you to it, He'll see you through it. We still have to get bumper stickers for that. We'll pass them out the next time. Right. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. So Goliath is heavily armed, armed, armed. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. 
This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air. So none of this slavery stuff. And the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. So, who was David trusting in? Or what was David trusting in to deliver him from this champion, Goliath? He was trusting in God. Okay. Did you notice in the first verse, when he's telling, what, telling him what Goliath is coming to him with? Did you notice that David doesn't say, and I'm coming to you with a sling and five smooth stones? He didn't say that. He compared his weapons of war to God. I want to say the God of war because that sounds kind of cool, but I'm not sure that's theologically appropriate. But anyway, you know what I'm saying. He didn't take the armor, but he did take the stone and the sling. So was he fully trusted in the Lord or not? Again, you see the tension. You see it there. And like I said, most of the major doctrines in the scripture have some level of tension. Like our responsibility to believe, but God's sovereignty and saving us. But there's a tension there that theologians have wrestled with for, for thousands of years, and we're never going to come to a 100% agreement solution on it until we get to glory and, and God reveals it to us. And that's okay. And here is, is a level of the responsibility of us acting, but also God being the one who is actually bringing this all to fruition and making it fruitful and effective. And so we see that. And I go back to that idea that God works through the faithfulness of those who serve him. And so when we want to know our part, our part is to be faithful and to act faithful. And, and acting faithfully would be using the things that God has put into our, into our arena, uh, things that he's put into our purview and our responsibility to act faithfully is to do it according to God's will and according to God's plan and not according to our own. And so those are just some things I think we see here and elsewhere in Scripture. For us to act faithfully, that's what it is to do our part. Now, what did David believe God wanted to teach the people that day? There's a God in Israel. There's a God in Israel. And how was he going to show them that? How do you like to discover us? He was going to show him that by. <laughs> That's Jerry's hearing aid battery going on. <laughs> he was going to do that by having the seemingly impossible occur. And everybody was going to know. But the amazing part about it is shouldn't they have already known that? <laughs> I understand. <laughs> but shouldn't we already know that? I mean, don't we remember the story of what was it? Wasn't the, the God's name Dagon and they kept falling over and they, then they learned that way, you know, that, that God is the true God and, and all these other things from the scriptures. But we are a forgetful people and the Israelites were a forgetful people. And so this was going to be one of those momentous occasions where God reveals it on the battlefield in a mighty way that's going to be told for thousands and thousands of years, even up until today. Uh, we, we're just about out of time, but I want to get through the end of this. And so I just want to kind of read it out. I might say a few words, but th that's the, the bulk of what I want to say. So it was when the Philistine arose, <coughs> he came and drew near to meet David. But David hurried and he ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. I don't think that Goliath was expecting him to run up. I don't. I'm thinking he was probably laughing at him. Then David put his hand in his bag. What kind of bag was this? Shepherd's shepherd bag. Shepherd's bag. At the best. At the best, as far as weapons of war, maybe he had a dagger in that bag. And so Goliath at no point is thinking, oh, no, i got to get ready, because he's sticking his hand into a little burlap bag is what he's doing. And David has to know that this guy is not going to be threatened by this at all. Then David put his hand in his bag and he took out a stone and he slung it and he struck the Philistine in his forehead 
I can just see this, this shield. Okay, a guy jumping up like this, you know, this little short guy trying to, he probably didn't have time to do it. I'm sure David was really, really fast. So the stone sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. There it is. Therefore, David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword, and drew it out of its sheath and killed him. So, I guess, knocked him down, incapacitated him, and allowed David to cut his head off with it. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. Now the men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the entrance of the valley and to the gates of Ek Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell along the, on the road to Shararim, even as far as Gath and Ekron. Then the children of Israel returned from chasing the Philistines, and they plundered their tents. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem. But he put his armor in his tent. Now that caught me earlier today. What is the significance? This isn't David's armor. This is the armor of Goliath. Obviously, David's got no use for it. It's huge stuff. He couldn't even wear the, the, the armor of Saul. And so, perhaps somewhere, it's been a long time since I've studied the rest of 1 and 2 Samuel, but perhaps somewhere there'll be something that will, will tell us what happened. So let's just kind of put a, a pin in that, so to speak, uh, this idea that he's put his armor in his tent. When Saul saw David going out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, as your soul lives, O king, I do not know. So the king said, inquire whose son this young man is, then as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, Whose son are you, young man? So David answered, I am the son of your servant Jesse, the Bethlehem. <coughs> so now we know where the money goes. Now we know where they get tax exemption and all that sort of stuff. And so, and again, we've already talked about the, 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 uh, the, the, the trouble with the fact that Saul doesn't seem to know David at this point. Um, and and, and I, I don't know that we'll fully understand all of it. It could be a period of time that it transpired between it. It could be that he was enamored by the spirit. It could be that David's older, he's in different clothes, any number of things. Uh, but I don't think it's a showstopper with regard to this story. All right? Does anybody have any questions or further comments? Okay. They were on the mountain and on the mountain and the valley and the How far? I don't know. Well, they had to be able to see each other, and they had to be able to hear each other, because Goliath would, every, every morning and evening, he would, you know, cry out like this. Voice it would. It would. But I, I don't know how far it would have been. So, um, I don't know that in that part of the world, you got to remember, this isn't like the Himalayas or the Rocky Mountains. The mountains in, in this part of the world aren't really huge. So they, they might have been at an elevation of a thousand feet over here and a thousand feet over there, and you know may, maybe a half a mile or three quarters. I, I have no idea. Um, I'd have to look a little bit closer into the geography of it all. So it's just a long way to draw the stone. Well, well, no. When he threw when he threw the stone, they ran up to each other. They met in the middle. Yeah, they, they, they met in the middle. It says that Goliath and the army came out, and so did David. And then it says once he approached that David hurried to him. So when he, when he slung that stone, he would have been probably within 50 feet of him, I would think. I mean, I, I would think that would be probably the limits of accuracy and, 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 and uh, what's the word? Velocity. Velocity and deadliness. There's another word I'm looking for. Lethality. There you go. So the, the, the lethality of that stone would have greatly diminished after probably 40 or 50 feet. So, unless David had a little turbo boost or something. I, I don't know. Uh, so. Anybody else? All right. Well, let me pray for us and bid everyone to do online. And thank you for, for tuning in, uh, whether it be live or, or later. And, um, and I hope that you'll look on the website, our emails, uh, and pray attentively. Uh, and let us know if you have any updates. Uh, please don't assume that somebody here will know what you know uh, so that we can pray attentively for all these things. Father, we thank you for this story and the opportunity to look at it in, in, in great detail over the past three weeks. And uh, there's much to be seen. Uh, and Lord, I, the thing that draws me uh, closest to it and is 
dear in my heart is just the idea that this is a picture, if you will, of what you would ultimately uh, accomplish through your humble servant, your son, Jesus Christ, on our behalf. He was our champion. He is our champion. Uh, he came down into the midst of the valley, and uh, he took care of business. And, uh, and that was for our good and for your glory. Uh, there's so much more that we can learn from this and, um, and from the stories to come. And I pray that we be able to unpack it all uh, each and every, every Wednesday. Uh, Father, I pray for those who couldn't be here. Uh, Lord, I know that so many are, uh, we have those who are in the hospital and care facilities, those who might be sick. Uh, there's this respiratory thing floating around and it's bothering some members of my own family and uh, it just seems to be kind of going through. It's not real serious, but it's kind of annoying. And I pray that you do with them. Uh, the weather's been kind of hairy the last few days, and it's that time of year. Uh, and I just pray that you provide us safety from uh, tornadoes and, and, and things of that nature. Uh, Lord, be with our church. We have a lot going on uh, at, the, uh, at the academy, uh, at the ELC, at our church, a mission trip coming up. Uh, and Lord, there's just a couple weeks left uh, to prepare uh, the team of, of, of youth and adults who are going to do some training there and witnessing and vacation Bible school and uh, Lord, I just pray that in every way everyone would know about our, understand our giftedness and that we'd be able to use that there uh, for the good of uh, First Baptist, uh, Norco, and, and the other places that we'll go, uh, for the people in that community, Lord, uh, that this, uh, this small, struggling church that we might be able to come alongside uh, and help them uh, kind of get a boost, if you will. And so uh, we just commit that to you, and we're just going to go like David and faithfully uh, just pray uh, that as we move that you would work in our midst and work through our faithful actions. Um, so, Father, I pray uh, as we go into this time of prayer that you'd hear our prayers and bid your ear now from heaven and answer them according to your perfect will. And we'll just give you all the glory and the honor and the praise for all that you have done and all that you're going to do. I ask it in Jesus' name.